Okay, I think we better get started. Um, first class, we had a, a mere 1,500 years to cover in background. Uh, the good news today is we're only going to have 400 years to cover. Uh, we will get that shorter uh, as, as the course progresses. Uh, but I wanted to pick up on the last item that was on the terms uh, from uh, Tuesday, uh, namely Martin Luther and the Reformation, and to uh, talk about uh, that uh, in our understanding of the development of European anti-Semitism. Uh, Luther, at the end of his life, wrote uh, a couple of tracts, tracts against the Jews, he called them, in which he uh, engaged in his usual vitriolic style, uh, criticizing them severely, uh, and uh, eventually, sadly, uh, a number of those quotations ended up in Nazi propaganda uh, some 400 years later, uh, and Luther was frequently cited by the Nazis uh, as a legitimization, a justification for uh, their later anti-Semitic views. Uh, I began my teaching career at Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma, uh, as a young, not only untenured professor, but and not only a non-Lutheran professor, but a, quote, unchurched professor. That was the term they used for people like me. Uh, I was a little apprehensive when I was going to teach the Holocaust for the first time there, uh, because by the second lecture we were going to get to Martin Luther, uh, and I was going to have things to say about Martin Luther that I thought might not fit well uh, with uh, some who were uh, complacently self-congratulatory uh, about uh, the founder of their particular branch of uh, Protestant Christianity. Uh, fortunately for me, in the fall semester, before I taught my course on the Holocaust for the first time, uh, the great, role, the great uh, Luther scholar, Roland Bainton, uh, from Yale, uh, came and gave a talk at, at Pacific Lutheran. And at the end of the talk, uh, someone in the religion department, uh, in fact, raised the question about Luther uh, and his two tracts against the Jews that he had written late in his life. Uh, and Dayton, without batting an eye, simply said the greatest tragedy of Luther's life was that he did not die ten years earlier. Uh, so uh, that gave me comfort. <laughs> I, I realized now we could, in fact, sort of categorize things and talk, one, about uh, Luther the theologian versus Luther the anti-Semite, and the younger Luther and the Luther of late age, uh, and that one could separate out things uh, in a way that uh, would, would uh, allow me to talk about it in a way that would, one, uh, not distort, but also uh, bring up very sensitive topics, uh, particularly for students uh, at a Lutheran school who had not been exposed to this before. In any case, uh, Luther, as a young priest uh, in the Catholic Church in Germany, became increasingly appalled by what he considered to be uh, the corruption of the Vatican and the corruption of church authorities uh, and uh, the way in which the church raised money uh, by, quote, selling indulgences. Uh, if you donated to the church, you could buy time out of purgatory for relatives and so forth, uh, all sorts of scams that were used to raise uh, money uh, in that way. And Luther began protesting uh, those sorts of things and eventually came to the conclusion uh, that he had to break with uh, the Church of Rome entirely, and this was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Others were also doing this at the time. Uh, so you have John Calvin in Geneva uh, and elsewhere, but Luther is, in a sense, the initial uh, spark in terms of the, uh, of the, of the, of the successful uh, breaking with uh, the Church of Rome and the ending of Christian unity uh, in Europe. In his early days, when he was criticizing uh, the Roman Catholic Church for what he considered its corruptions and failings, uh, he also uh, was known as a basically a very favorable attitude towards the Jews. Uh, and uh, it was, in fact, because he thought, of course, uh, you couldn't convert Jews as long as the church was so corrupt. Why would anyone be attracted uh, to, uh, to uh, Christianity uh, in the form of that day. So let me give you a quote from the early Luther before we get to the late Luther 
If I had been a Jew, I should have preferred to be a pig before I became a Christian, seeing how the imbeciles of ignorant louts govern and teach the Christian faith. And the Jews see, uh, the, and the Jews are the good relatives, the cousins, the brother of our Lord. Hence I beg my dear Pappas uh, to call me a Jew when they're tired of calling me a heretic. Uh, so for Luther in the beginning, uh, he was considered heretical and outside the church. Jews were too. Uh, they were both uh, rejects from Catholicism, uh, and uh, he felt sympathy for them. Once uh, his own reformation, however, and break with the church has succeeded, and Lutheranism becomes more institutionalized in Germany, uh, and he becomes a kind of national hero, uh, leading the rejection of the control of, of the German church from abroad, by those Italian popes, and now uh, German Lutherans would take uh, matters in their own hands. Uh, for him, you had a Reformed church. Uh, now, of course, the Jews should see the light and all convert, and of course they did. Uh, and uh, particularly in his old age, Luther became very bitter about this fact, uh, and that was the circumstance when he wrote his tracts against the Jews. Now, Luther had, all, had long been a very violent polemicist. Uh, one thing you should be clear, uh, unlike the Catholic Church, Lutherans don't believe in saints, and Luther was no saint and has never been, been promoted as such. Uh, and uh, he is often uh, verbally, uh, rhetorically quite violent uh, when he wrote about anybody who uh, was on the other side. Uh, but uh, the tracts against the Jews, in hindsight, uh, using the same kind of vitriol uh, in, uh, with the hindsight of the Holocaust, of course, take on a much more ominous uh, tone. Uh, but so in this regard, I think we also should say that Luther is not original. Uh, he may have been a very original theologian in terms of devising uh, Lutheran theology. As an anti-Semite, he's totally banal, uh, merely repeating and summarizing virtually all of the various accusations that we have talked about in the last lecture. Uh, that accumulated through the Middle Ages. And the tracks against the Jews, if you want a summary of medieval anti-Semitism and the whole cluster of, of accusations against the Jews, they are all collected there. As I say, nothing original in them, uh, but uh, terribly nasty stuff uh, nonetheless. Uh, so uh, here is the late Luther. I read you the early Luther. Here is the late Luther. Uh, let's see if I can find my place here. Uh, referring to the Jews. They let us work in the sweat of our noses to earn money and property from them while they sit behind their oven, lazy, let off gas, bake pears, and drink, live softly and well from our wealth. They have captured us and our goods through their accursed usury. That's the, the Jew as the usurer. Here you can readily see how they understand and obey the fifth commandment of God, namely that they are thirsty bloodhounds and murderers of all Christendom, with full intent now for more than 1,400 years. And indeed, they were often uh, burned uh, to death upon the accusation that they had poisoned water and wells. That's the Black Death. Stolen children uh, and torn and hacked them apart in order to cool their temper secretly with Christian blood. There's the blood libel. We do not kidnap their children and pierce them through. We do not poison their wells. We do not thirst for their blood. How then do we incur that such terrible anger on the part of such great and holy children of God? There is no other explanation of this than that God has struck them with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. So we are even at fault in not avenging all this innocent blood of our Lord and of the Christians which shed which, which they shed for 300 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, and the blood of the children they have shed since then, which shall shine henceforth from their eyes and their skin. We are at fault in not slaying them. That's Martin Luther and the end of his life, which, as Roman Bacon said, it would have been better for all of us if he had died 10 years earlier. Uh, in any case, uh, the uh, Reformation, both in the case of Protestantism, rejected much of uh, Catholic theology, unfortunately, did not reject uh, the anti-Semitic tradition within Catholic tradition, but in fact, as I say, summarized it and amplified it. Other branches of the Protestant Reformation, such as John Calvin, uh, 
Presbyterians uh, did not uh, adopt uh, and carry on the anti-Semitic tradition. And even some Lutheran branches, particularly, say, in Scandinavia, uh, did not uh, seem to take this on. Uh, but Luther and Lutherans in Germany uh, did not distinguish themselves from Catholics uh, in terms of perpetuating uh, a now centuries-old tradition of anti-Semitism. The Reformation did, however, uh, trigger off a series of what was referred to as the Wars of Religion, in which Catholic and Protestant countries in Europe now fought each other. Uh, with Christians building, busy killing each other, they had less time to harass and to torment Jews, uh, and uh, Jews could sense, sink into the background a bit. And then, following the exhaustion of the wars of religion, when it finally occurred to Europeans that killing each other for religious beliefs was maybe not uh, the healthiest and best thing to do, uh, the temperature of religious persecution began to sink, and uh, Europe entered a more secular period in which religion played a less dominant role in European life. And this was introduced or since led into both by the scientific revolution, uh, which began to give people a view of the world we lived in based more on science than on uh, received religious doctrine, uh, and what was known as the Enlightenment. Uh, basically, the Enlightenment was a movement of secularization. And, of course, the scientific revolution begins in the 17th century with Newton and Galileo and, and so forth. The Enlightenment, we generally say the, the, the key the heart of that was in the 18th century, the 1700s, uh, in which uh, lots of uh, what we might call public intellectuals might be the right term, uh, began uh, to demand uh, that the role of the church in society be curbed and restrained. The church up until then often controlled, for instance, the curriculum at schools and universities, controlled censorship, what could be published and could not be published, did not believe in freedom of the press, did not believe in freedom of conscience. Uh, and so the public intellectuals of the day uh, began a kind of campaign uh, to break the authority of the church over intellectual and cultural life in Europe, to demand freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of the press, uh, and uh, carried on then uh, a, a campaign to make life more secular that tried to portray the church as high as tradition bound, superstitious, backward, resistant of reason. Uh, scientific revolution began to validate human reason. Human reason could discover the, nat the laws of nature uh, through mathematic formulas, Newton's uh, equations uh, for gravitation and so forth, being key to an example of this. If you freed human mind to use its reason to understand the world around it, uh, you could discover all sorts of things, uh, and that uh, you, to do that, however, you had to reject church tradition, the church persecution, for instance, of Galileo uh, as one of the key scientists, uh, and uh, to move on to uh, putting the church in its place and, and ending its stranglehold on uh, intellectual and cultural life in Europe. So this was a culture war, a uh, militant culture war, fought between secularists on the one hand uh, and church authorities on the other, uh, in which uh, the attempt to uh, discredit church authority, uh, church tradition, to free man uh, from uh, that, uh, that control was at the forefront uh, of the activities of many public intellectuals or, or key intellectual figures of the Enlightenment. Uh, in all of this, they began to teach the necessity of freedom of conscience, of religious toleration, uh, of allowing people uh, uh, to, to publish and, and speak uh, their mind, free press, free speech, uh, and uh, that, uh, as I say, the target here uh, frequently uh, and most uh, uh, focus was on uh, to, in a sense, break the hold that the church had uh, in order to gain that new that new freedom. The implications of this, of course, was that this was uh, sort of the anti-dominance of the Christian religious tradition. Uh, but much the same attitude was now brought towards uh, the Jewish minority as well. Uh, that if in the past Jews have been told, if you convert to Christianity, then all of the discriminations against you disappear, 
uh, the intellectuals in Leighton were arguing if you give up you know, uh, your traditional hidebound Judaism, just as we're urging others to give up their tradition-bound, hidebound, anti-intellectual Christianity, and you all accept the brave new world of free thought and free reason, uh, then you can be assimilated and treated as equal. So many of the, of the intellectuals of the Enlightenment not only attack Christianity, but they attack Judaism both as superstitions, holdovers from an old era whose time has passed, and for Jews who would basically assimilate to the new secular era uh, and give up uh, their Jewish traditions, they were welcome to be assimilated into the avant-garde of European culture. Uh, and uh, the same offer, of course, was made uh, to the Christian majority. Now, some historians looking at some of the nasty comments people like Voltaire and Diderot made about Jews uh, want to put this into a context of a continuity in anti-Semitism. Uh, I think that is a, a mistake. If you look at uh, what we've seen already in terms of the anti-Semitism of the Middle Ages and what we will see in uh, 20th century national socialism, uh, and the number of intellectuals uh, attacking Judaism on the grounds that they are attacking Christianity as well, and that they're treating Jews like everyone else, give up this whole superstition and come on over uh, from the forces of darkness to the forces of light, as they saw it in their own minds, uh, uh, is hardly uh, an anti-Semitic tradition or a dynamic of anti-Semitism in the same mold as we'll see in the Middle Ages when Jews are stamped is inherently different, inherently inferior, inherently evil, and again, that same uh, stamping of immutable inferiority and evil uh, will be made in the 20th century. That's not what this debate is about. This is a debate about secularization and about the worth and the power of all religions, uh, not aimed specifically uh, at, at Judaism. Uh, so. As I said, then since the Enlightenment was, was the beginning of the demands for religious toleration, religious freedom, uh, freedom of conscience, uh, and to curb back uh, the powers of the church to create a more secular society. That created a fair amount of the intellectual underpinnings of what I would call, or not I call, but what the great British historian Eric Hobsbawm called uh, the dual revolution. Uh, and the dual revolution, uh, we date usually from the late uh, 18th century, the late 1700s, uh, and uh, it is going to be a key turning point in the history of Western civilization in terms of transforming European society in so many ways. Uh, on the one hand, there is particularly a political dimension to it, and that political dimension can be seen in the American Revolution, uh, here uh, in the U.S., and the French Revolution uh, in Europe, uh, in which traditional monarchical authority was rejected, in which uh, the privileges of class were rejected, and what was carried out was a liberal democratic revolution. Much of this based upon uh, the philosophy of an earlier Enlightenment figure, John Locke, and summarized, perhaps in this most succinct form, by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and went on to construct a notion that governments are based on a contract between the people and the government in the form of a constitution. When governments fail to protect those inalienable rights, they may be rebelled against and overthrown. The 13 colonies were rebelling because they said George the, the, the third, George the was not, the third was not recognizing the, the rights of Englishmen uh, in the colonists in the states. So it was a democratic liberal con uh, revolution uh, out to set the notion that one, uh, governments should be democratic. Sovereignty should reside in the people, not in a monarch who is established by, uh, uh, allegedly by God's anointment. Uh, that people are citizens of that state. They are not subjects of the king. Uh, that they have these rights. When those rights are violated, they can throw out a government and establish a new one 
that uh, will. Uh, and so the notion of constitutional government, representative government, popular sovereignty, democratic elections, all of this comes out of the American Revolution and the French Revolution uh, of, of this period, a rejection of divine right monarchy, the notion that government is established by religious authority, uh, and that it is based instead on a secular contract between the citizens in the form of popular sovereignty to write a constitution that uh, establishes equality before the law, self-governance, uh, and rule of the people. Uh, and that is a dramatic change. I mean, that just basically is going to end European governance as it had occurred uh, before then. Uh, a second aspect of the political revolution of this period, inequality before the law, the democratic revolution, the creation of governments that are not there by virtue of divine right monarchy, but by virtue of the people, was that almost all of those who, the United States with uh, its, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, First Amendment, which uh, basically uh, says there can't be any established church, a separation between church and state. The government won't interfere in the church, and the church will not interfere in the state. And these are two different realms of life. And people should be free to have whatever religion they want, practice as they wish, as long as they don't infringe upon and impose those beliefs on anyone else. Uh, and so government may not establish religion, but it may not interfere in the private practice of religion. Uh, and uh, therefore, this compartmentalization then was part of this revolution. The French Revolution explicitly uh, is based upon a uh, religious toleration, freedom of religion, uh, and freedom of conscience. And this, of course, means that also, alongside equality before the law, that you may not have discriminatory legislation that affects some people but not others that treats one part of the population different from others, all of the anti-Jewish measures that have been compiled over the ages that ban Jews from this or that economic activity, that curtail them in this that way, now have to be abolished. Equality for the law creates what we call Jewish emancipation. The freeing of the Jews in those areas where the liberal democratic revolution was carried out first in France and then Napoleonic armies carry it to many other parts of Europe, meant emancipation, the freedom of Jews from all of the accumulated discriminations that were part of the legal systems of various countries that had piled up over the Middle Ages and remained, in a sense, on the books uh, into the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So one consequence of the liberal democratic revolution and the notion both of equality before the law and freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, is that all of these uh, anti-Jewish measures, discrimination against Jews, uh, basically is erased from the legal codes of Europe uh, as this doctrine spreads to various parts of Europe. Another aspect of the political side of the dual revolution was nationalism. Up until then, kingdoms were the properties of royal families. Uh, that they basically, uh, the, you know, the king of France could marry uh, some uh, Italian princess, and if she inherited uh, a principality in Italy, he could be king of France and the Duke of Tuscany at one and the same time, because these were simply properties owned by royal families and inherited in whatever way they worked out marriage alliances. The political side of the dual revolution establishes, as I said, the doctrine of popular sovereignty. Nations belong to the people, not the people. They were not the property of monarchs. They were the collective being of the people themselves. Uh, and that uh, as such, uh, you, you played a role in the popular sovereignty of the nation, of being a member of that nation, by virtue of being a citizen of that nation. You were not the subject of the king. You were a citizen of the nation, and the nation collectively was all of its citizens. If citizens had rights guaranteed by the nation, they also had obligations then to the nation. Once you're part of the nation, uh, then you have obligations. In the course of the French Revolution, the biggest obligation is going to be universal military service. Uh, as Napoleon's armies are going to roll over Europe, uh, 
the French are going to be drafted and put into these mass armies of military, you know, motivated patriots fighting for their country against mercenary armies raised in Prussia and elsewhere, uh, where they're fighting because of King of Prussia, as, as Frederick put it. We want to make sure our soldiers are more afraid of their own officers than they are of the enemy. Uh, and that created for a while in Europe a huge disparity in fighting effectiveness between the nationally patriotically motivated French armies of the French Revolution and the dragooned and, uh, and coerced and mercenary armies of the royal families, uh, and helps to explain why Napoleon could conquer all of Europe and spread uh, the doctrines of the French Revolution. But the notion of nationalism, the notion that citizens are part of a national community, uh, and they are members of that community by virtue of their citizenship, and that they are owe obligations to that community, uh, was another aspect of this uh, dual of the political side of the dual revolution. Uh, and uh, in this case, it meant that Jews could become part of the national community. If Jews were citizens, uh, like anyone else, the test was not whether you were Catholic, Protestant, or Jew. The test was, are you a citizen of France? Uh, and so with equality before the law and the notion of the national community, uh, then this increases ways in which, in a sense, previously excluded pariah Jews could become part of the nation uh, and part of the national community. Uh, that was the, the, the political side, we might say, of the dual revolution. Uh, the economic side of the dual revolution is what we refer to as the industrial revolution. In the late 18th century, not so much in France, but in England, uh, people began to make a series of technological discoveries that managed to harness first water power and then uh, steam power, uh, harness it to various machines, and to create uh, basically first in textiles and later elsewhere, new sources of energy and new ways of producing things. Up until the 18th century, basically, power was generated by human muscle and animal muscle. Uh, once you started harnessing streams in terms of uh, water wheels and water power, and then uh, to steam power, and eventually, of course, to fossil fuel power, uh, you, you began, uh, and then you harnessed those to machines that were going to produce things. In a very short period, uh, Europe was now producing material goods, making wealth, at a rate that was exponentially greater than anything anyone had ever experienced up until that point in human history. Up until that point in human history, most people are living in a subsistence level, scratching out enough to keep alive in agriculture, uh, to produce a teeny thin layer of surplus that the government's taxed and supported uh, other people who did uh, non-agricultural activities. Ninety percent of the population basically worked on the land to support uh, other people who could specialize in the military, in government, uh, or in other kinds of activities. Uh, and everyone was always very close to uh, catastrophe if you had a, a, a harvest failure or whatever, uh, and life was precarious. Up until then, basically, a quarter of the population didn't live beyond the age of one. Half the population did not live beyond the age of 20. And if you reached your 40s, you were in old age. That was the human condition for centuries. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is going to transform the material world we live in and the material world that human beings could produce. It made Europe suddenly incredibly more rich and militarily incredibly more powerful than any other part of the world. Uh, both because they now uh, had incredible more wealth, but they could harness and mobilize that wealth through the mobilizing capacities of the new nations that could basically uh, call upon uh, their citizens uh, and, can, and basically organize them for nationwide kinds of projects. Well, the Industrial Revolution is going to also basically be the basis for a vast urbanization of Europe. From that point up until now, we've gone from 90% of the population being needed to grow the food to keep everybody alive to now where a teeny fraction uh, of a highly urbanized population grows food, and the vast majority of everybody else sits in classrooms listening to lectures, 
uh, or working in an office or working in all sorts of other jobs, uh, a very the vast majority of, of, of any post-industrial society does not engage in agriculture, but in all sorts of other activities. Uh, and that uh, is, of course, again, a, a utter transformation of, of the way in which human beings have, have lived and experienced their lives. Uh, this revolution had a huge impact then on Europe in the sense that urban cities grow up, populations concentrate there, uh, new kinds of, uh, of, of employment in cities, both in factories, but also in the businesses that are financing them, selling their goods, spreading them around, new transportation, the railways, steamships, and so forth, all of which are going to vastly transform uh, access to uh, markets in different parts of Europe and then in different parts of the world. What this meant for the Jewish population is that at the very point that they are emancipated from the old restrictions that were upon them, uh, they are also experiencing a period of immense economic transformation in which all sorts of new opportunities are opening up. Who is positioned to move into the new economic opportunities more quickly than those who are not bound to landowning as in the past, who have been kept out of all sorts of activities, who now can, in a sense, leapfrog over much of the rest of the population and move into the cutting edge new occupations. Uh, so the Jews are going to profit very much from the Industrial Revolution. They are going to move to the forefront of finance, to the forefront of, uh, of uh, uh, what we might call the professions, law doctors, lawyers, journalists, uh, and that Jews will not only profit now that they have been released from old and old restrictions, but they are going to particularly profit at those areas of the economy that are, are the most the changing, the most rapidly opening up the new the new opportunities that are there. Uh, so the Jews are going to gain new political rights, and they're going to gain new economic prominence, experience unprecedented social mobility. Uh, and uh, the result is, is that the profile of Jews in Europe becomes relatively skewed. Uh, it had been skewed by the old discriminations uh, that limited Jews in what they could do. Now it will be skewed in an utterly different way as they become highly visible as the most socially mobile and those who have profited the most and taken advantage of the new opportunities in a disproportionate way. So one of the accusations uh, of the anti-Semitism this success is going to produce is that Jews dominate banking. Jews dominate uh, department stores, ownerships. Uh, Jews are dominate as doctors and lawyers. And statistically, those are not false accusations. What no one says, of course, is that if Jews are overrepresented there, it's because they are underrepresented in all the traditional occupations. In terms of landowning, Jews are vastly underrepresented. Uh, they are neither the great landowners nor the small peasants, which is what most of the population did. Jews are underrepresented in the civil service. They are not the people hired by government uh, to govern and run things. Jews are underrepresented certainly in the military and above all the military officer corps. You don't have Jewish generals and admirals in most countries. Uh, and, and so the result is... Uh, Jews will be overrepresented represented in some areas, particularly the new opportunities that the Industrial Revolution opens. They will be underrepresented in more traditional occupations from which they had been previously excluded, and it's much harder to break into something where somebody else already has uh, themselves well established. Hence, uh, Jews don't, despite being freed by emancipation, do not move into the military profession, do not move into landowning, uh, do not move into the civil service in any you know, disproportionate way. They do move into uh, the new professions and the new economic activities uh, which uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, is going to uh, make available. So the dual uh, revolution, in a sense, is one that has huge benefits for the Jewish community in Europe. They are going to prosper in terms of economic well-being, social mobility, new political freedom, uh, in ways that have, they have been prevented from for centuries. 
and now suddenly the doors of opportunity are going to open. But at the same time, that is going to create a backlash or a reaction. Much as we have seen in the Middle Ages, what I call European, Europe's first great modernization crisis, where for the most part you had new cities, new wealth, new trade, new commerce, new money economy, uh, and uh, this benefited much of the population. You also had people who did not benefit, people who we would call the social losers of this economic transformation, uh, people who are the ones who are going to bear the cost of some areas becoming relatively less important than they were before. Uh, so that if you were a skilled craftsman uh, who made your living as a skilled tailor or shoemaker, and suddenly machines can make uh, suits uh, and shoes that can be sold off the rack at a department store uh, at a fraction of the cost, uh, you can still serve the niche economy of a luxury clientele, but uh, the booming uh, new market is going to be selling uh, factory produced goods to the population at large, uh, and your position in society is going to drop. And so skilled artisans are going to be diminished as factory production becomes more and more central. Uh, if you used to be a, a small merchant running your shop that sells one kind of goods, uh, and suddenly a department store opens that sells everything. Uh, this is the Walmart phenomenon that began not with Walmart, but begins, in fact, with department stores in the 19th century. Uh, suddenly, by high volume sales of cheap goods, uh, you can basically put out of business, or at least vastly diminish, the role of family stores that had, for, for, for centuries in some of these villages, been the family that sold X, Y, or Z. Uh, and now uh, they can't compete with the new uh, department store that's open down the street. Uh, so that there are sort of people who are going to, to, to not benefit, in a sense, from this, but are going to find themselves diminished. Certainly as agriculture becomes less and less a, uh, a, a slice of the economic pie, uh, again, uh, the agrarian part of the economy is going to find themselves uh, less and less prosperous, when you introduce steamships and railways. So you can grow wheat in Kansas and sell it in Europe cheaper than you can grow it next door, uh, then small farmers are going to be pressed to the wall uh, as, uh, as, as mecha you know, more mechanized farming in the Midwest and mass transportation uh, means that they are engaged in a production that simply isn't competitive on the world market. There was no world market earlier. Uh, the introduction of uh, imports from abroad, uh, what we might call now globalization. This was the beginnings, in a sense, of, of uh, if, if the Walmart phenomenon didn't start now, neither did globalization. Uh, and that uh, there were, uh, at that point, again, people who are the social losers of that process. Uh, and uh, for them, this is a complex phenomenon. Basically, you know, social scientists and economists didn't even sort of invent the term modernization. Uh, to come to grips, you create modernization theory, it was in the 1960s, to try to explain what this gradual transformation of the world was that happened first in London, England, and then spread to Europe and North America, and then has successively spread over other parts of the world. Uh, if scholars didn't understand what this was, no, you know, why would a small shopkeeper uh, or a small peasant uh, or a small artisan possibly understand uh, what uh, wider impersonal anonymous forces that work in the world economy were that were doing them in. And for people that are suffering and feel they have been victimized, and the victimization is, as I say, a broad anonymous process of beyond their capacity to, gra capacity to grasp, the next reaction is not why is this happening, but who is doing this to me? And when you ask the question, who is doing this to me, you also look around and you say, who is benefiting? If I'm losing and somebody else is gaining, they must be gaining because I am losing. Uh, and of course, they look around and who are the visible gainers? Who are the most visible gainers in terms of a new social mobility, a new access to the cutting edge new professions and economic activities of Europe? What is utterly visible is, quote, the Jew. <laughs> 
uh, and so uh, a, uh, a new anti-Semitism of economic resentment, of a feeling once again uh, that the, the, that uh, the Jew is out uh, to take uh, to take wealth, to take it from someone else. Jews are becoming wealthy because they are stealing it from Christians, uh, and, and 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 so forth becomes in a sense, the, the beginning of a revival, a reactivization uh, of anti-Semitism, giving it a new lease on life. Uh, and that uh, this uh, is, uh, in a sense, a, 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 the dark underside or the, 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 the backlash or the uh, price, one might say, to be paid for all the benefits that European society and above all the benefits the Jews within European society had gained uh, by virtue of the dual revolution. Uh, so this, uh, in a sense, is one aspect of the story of, of how we, of why anti-Semitism is going to become current and reactivated and important again in European life after it seemed to be on the decline uh, from the wars of religion through the uh, Enlightenment uh, and uh, at the beginnings of the dual revolution. Uh, so we should keep that in mind. Uh, that I want to bring in a number of other sort of more tangential topics because they're going to be part of, uh, of a toxic brew, in a sense, uh, in which a number of things get mixed together. Because not only is there going to be a revival of anti-Semitism, but it's going to become packed with, it's going to become in Basically intertwined with uh, racism, uh, nationalism, imperialism, uh, social Darwinism, all of these things that are popping up at this time uh, that are going to give medieval anti Semitism a new modernized lease on life in which it claims to be scientific, claims to be not a matter of religious prejudice, but a matter of scientific racism. Uh, and uh, that path uh, is, is, in a sense, starting, kickstarted, we might say, by the resentments, the economic anti-Semitism uh, that results from the Industrial Revolution and the Dual Revolution uh, to become a much more complex intellectual phenomenon uh, that is going to take over most of the old negative anti-stereotype of the Middle Ages, but update it. Uh, to uh, the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Okay, and among the terms uh, we're going to deal with, uh, one of them is racism. Uh, and uh, as, I, as I think I argued at the end of, of, of the last period, much of the medieval concept of anti-Semitism, in which Jews were considered immutably to have certain characteristics which made them not only distinct, but made them inferior, not only inferior, but made them evil or dangerous, uh, was, we, we would not call racist, but it was without any racist theory. They didn't have a concept of race. Uh, and so it was this broad negative, anti, anti, uh, broad negative stereotype that functioned like racism. Uh, but I want to talk now about how, in a sense, Europeans became consciously racist and would begin to invoke the explanation for, the justification for their anti-Semitism, ultimately, uh, as being based in a racism that was claimed to be scientific, claimed to be a matter of fact. We would now say race is a construction. It's something we make up in our minds to, to try to organize the way we think about different people. Uh, but... Uh, at this period, it is going to be seen not as a, as a human construct, uh, but is going to be seen as a claim to be uh, a, a basically a scientific fact. And it is that aspect of this that, that we want to start with, uh, start with first. Uh, over the course, not only during the period of the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment, is of course also a period uh, when Europe is expanding uh, its horizons, and particularly with uh, the a great growing development of European states that are more and more powerful vis-a-vis -vis other parts of the world because of uh, the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but even before that, uh, a growing sort of commerce and power, 
uh, Europe began to conquer other parts of the world. Uh, and so we have this period of what we call imperialism, uh, where Europeans went out, uh, discovered various parts of the world, then took them over, uh, ruled them as empires, uh, and also, of course, encountered people very different from themselves. Uh, and initially, these encounters often were seen as encounters with exotic people. Uh, but as the disparity in power between Europeans and others became more pronounced, and this power was used by Europeans uh, to not just go there, but to conquer those areas, control those areas, exploit those areas, uh, and uh, to dominate the populations there, and in the case certainly of Africa, to enslave people, bring them across the Atlantic, as commodities to be sold, uh, that uh, this relationship between Europe and other peoples around the world uh, became not one of kind of an exotic encounter, but uh, one of European domination uh, over others. Uh, and uh, given uh, what seemed to be Europeans, the self-evident fact that Europeans had superior power that enabled them to do this, uh, this was interpreted as evidence of European superiority in every other regard as well. And so the encounter with other peoples around the world became one in which you ranked, you began to rank people uh, in terms of, uh, of superiority and inferiority. This also reflected uh, part of the scientific wave of the Enlightenment. In Enlightenment, uh, people are looking at the natural world discovering various ways of understanding the natural world by use of reason, certainly the physics of, of Newton, for instance, are an example of this, but, but also applying this then uh, to what I call the organic world. And so you have the emergence of biology, zoology, anthropology, trying to organize what they see in the plant kingdom, what they see in the animal kingdom. This is when you create your... your, 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 uh, your, your, your your trees of species and genuses and, and families and all of this, uh, so that you're making kind of cat, make sense of it by categorizing. And uh, this urge to categorize, to, to in a sense become the uh, intellectual master of, of a topic by being able to categorize what it is you're looking at, was part of the way in which Enlightenment uh, people looked at the world around them. Uh, and so in this imperial encounter, uh, the urge to categorize the various different peoples that they had encountered uh, takes place, and the categorization becomes one of what we would now call color coding, in which you began to rank people around the world depending upon the color of their skin. Uh, and white Europeans would be at the top, self-evidently at the top, because, look, they have the power to go elsewhere and to conquer other areas. Uh, but then you would have what they would call the yellow people, uh, the Asians. You would have the red people, the native indigenous of North America, South America. You would have uh, the blacks of Africa. And so you began to talk about these, quote, races, the white race, the black race, the yellow race, the red race. Uh, some would include the Polynesian, oceanic race. Uh, some would then come to seeing the Arab world as the Semitic race. Uh, but basically, they may have differed on the categories, but the notion that you could categorize these broad areas of the world uh, on the basis of uh, different kinds of physical appearance, and that physical appearance above all being a difference of color of skin, uh, became a kind of self-evident truth to Europeans. It just seemed obvious to them and was confirmed by the experiences uh, that uh, they had in terms of dominating these various parts of the world. Uh, very quickly, of course, in, in all of this, even say in, in, in North America with the importation uh, or the New World importation of slaves, uh, one had to not only uh, carve out uh, a, 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 you know, blacks, but also had to basically uh, define a whole set of laws and rules uh, that separated them, say, from white indentured servants in the colonies, uh, so that uh, you not only conceived of them as different, but you created all sorts of legal categories uh, of segregation and deprivation of rights that ensured, much like the self-fulfilling prophecy of the way in which Jews' profile was shaped in the Middle Ages, so, uh, for instance, the way in which 
blacks brought to the United States as slaves would be uh, shaped and dominated by uh, the power of those who had enslaved them. Uh, so you see, uh, basically, this emergence then of a, of a view that the world is made up of races. But at that point, Europe, white Europeans are still seen as, quote, the white race, and you had these broad blocks uh, of, of others. Uh, in that, uh, one also comes to uh, a, increasingly a notion that Race will explain history. Uh, that, in fact, if you are looking at the human behavior, what are the laws of human behavior that govern why things happen in history in the same way the laws of physics govern the way that planets you know, circle around the sun or why apples fall from trees uh, with gravitation? You know, the notion was that if you only use your reason well enough, you would find the same kinds of scientific laws uh, to govern uh, human activity uh, as you found uh, in governing uh, the inanimate world, physical objects. So we had really the beginning sense of economics. What is the science of how economics works? Political science. Uh, very word is there. Sometimes we call it government, but they're calling it political science. Some says there are scientific laws that govern the way people uh, relate in terms of, of, of their political behavior. And so out of this, uh, the notion in particular, uh, by a number of thinkers in the 19th century, uh, was to try to find what is the secret to the laws of history? What is it that makes history happen the way it does? Now, Karl Marx came along and he said, history is class struggle. History happens the way it happens is because people's relationship to the means of production creates various social classes. You have struggle between those social classes, and how that struggle works out uh, is the way history has developed over time. So you go from the feudal era of the domination of the landowners uh, to the capitalist era with the domination of what he called the middle classes or the bourgeoisie to the future predictable, scientifically predictable triumph of the proletariat, the working classes, uh, as uh, they came to the fore. Uh, but class as and class struggle as the explanation of history was not the only scientific explanation of history that emerged at this time. Uh, and it was a Frenchman named Gobineau that said, no, history is not the struggle of classes. History is the struggle of races and that we will understand history and the way it works out if we understand that uh, there is racial struggle and that how that is resolved uh, is going to tell us which way things happen in history, who goes up and who goes down. Now, Kovino, in fact, broadly talked about three different races, the white race, the yellow race, the black race, and he characterized them the white race is the superior culture-creating race characterized by honor and virtue and diligence and industriousness and self-discipline. Uh, and they were uh, the Europeans, particularly European nobility, uh, that has raised up the Western civilization uh, to the dominant part it had uh, around the world and said it's self-evident how could Europeans have conquered so much of the world if, in fact, uh, the... European ruling class, particularly European nobility, was not the peak of the white race which managed to do this. And then he looked at what he called the yellow races and, as, and then the black races, and he ascribed to them, in effect, uh, a kind of conflation of his understanding of classes in Europe and races around the world. So the yellow race becomes kind of the middle class. They are the materialistic uh, uh, people, the ones concerned with grubby matters of money and commerce and trade, not high culture. Uh, they are consumed by greed. They are not virtuous and honorable. Uh, and then at the bottom, the black races were viewed as physically powerful, sensuous, but dangerous and totally undisciplined uh, and totally without culture. And they, in his mind, reminded him of the lower class of Europe uh, that had to be kept uh, in its place. So you had this strange combination in Gobineau 
of seeing the world divided between white, yellow, and black races, but reading those upon the European social scene of nobility, middle class, and uh, lower class, or the masses. For Gobineau, the unspoken or the unquestioned assumption was for uh, the white nobility, the white ruling class that had produced all of this, to remain in its place, it had to remain pure. Pure race is good, mixed race is bad. The way in which you had degeneration, the way in which a dominant race declined and fell, was to not keep itself pure, was to mix itself with others. Uh, and therefore, for Gobineau, uh, the great threat of the democratic, liberal democratic revolution, which abolished noble privilege and said nobles no longer have rights that everybody else does not have, opened the way for the rise of middle classes to accumulate wealth uh, and become even economically more powerful than society, than the old landing and the nobility, was that this would lead to intermarriage. And intermarriage meant that the European nobility was going to decline, to degenerate, and Europe's central role uh, as the dominant civilization in the world, with the civilization created by the white nobility that had kept itself pure, was going to disappear, and Europe was, in a sense, going to hell in a handbasket. It was on the path of degeneration. And the way to you know, end that, uh, get out of that, uh, was to restore the exclusive privileges of the nobility and uh, mixing uh, nobles with others. Uh, and uh, all of this, in a sense, was analogous to uh, the European superiority of the world, the nobility of Europe, and the superiority over the middle and lower classes of, of Europe. So this is, this is a, a lot of mishmash. I mean, these, when you're reading this stuff, you don't look for crystal clear, sharp thinking. Uh, these are very muddled stuff that, I was to say, confuses class and race uh, in many ways. Uh, but uh, this is somebody trying, grasping, to, uh, to figure out, in a sense, the science of history and trying to argue uh, uh, that it is basically a matter of race. So, Gobineau introduces the notion of, of history as racial struggle. He is not particularly an anti-Semite. In his view, Jews, too, uh, are endangered by emancipation. They were a hardy create, culture-creating race in Jewish Culture is threatened by emancipation when they mix with everybody else, too. Both the European nobility and the Jews are going to be declining and degenerating uh, in this new liberal democratic uh, 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 era that allows uh, intermarriage and ends uh, preserving the purity uh, of the European nobility. So introduction of the notion of race struggle as the secret of history does not initially start with any connection uh, to anti-Semitism. A second kind of dominant notion, or I should say, you know, alongside uh, this notion of race and race struggle that comes with Gobineau, uh, is social Darwinism. Now, of course, Darwin is one of the key scientists of the 19th century and published his book on the uh, evolution of the, uh, you know, the origins of the species in which he is going to argue that you get all this variation within uh, the plant and the particular animal kingdom through a process of natural selection and the survival of the fittest. Those characteristics of a particular species that are most suited to a particular environment will allow the, 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 you know, the, 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 the animals carrying those characteristics to prosper and multiply more fast than those that don't. So that in certain areas, uh, you'll have the emergence of a certain kind of bird in another area uh, of a different one. And then you get these variety of species because you have this adaption to a variety of different environments. And trying to explain then the, the, the scientific background for why you have this vast proliferation of related species. In that, of course, environment was key that basically it is adaptation to environment, or in a sense, uh, uh, characteristics that, it, that a, that a, that a uh, creature has most suited to the environment that allows it to become the fittest and the fittest that survives. 
but it is basically an environment, you know, cru crucial to this in a sense is environment and the adaptability to environment. For others, however, this metaphor, or this model of natural selection and survival of the fittest could now, they claim, be applied not to explaining the variation between species of the animal kingdom, but also become applied to human behavior and to how groups of human beings acted. Uh, and that uh, the shift then took place away from the importance of environment to the importance of heredity. That people and groups of people, races, were locked in a kind of competition, and the fittest were going to survive, and they deserved to survive because that is the rest. And those that were weak and not fit and not adaptable to their situation would pass by the wayside, uh, and uh, the fitter people would rise to the top. Uh, and thus a justification, for instance, of European imperialism was a, simply, this is simply a, a natural process of survival of the fittest. Europeans are proving themselves more fit uh, and are winning in this struggle for survival and survival of the fittest. Uh, and it's because uh, they carry certain hereditary characteristics that make them superior to others. So social Darwinism then added to what was already this notion of racial hierarchy and gave it now a real scientific gloss uh, that if you take the but became increasingly accepted as the scientific validity of theory of evolution, but then in a non-scientific way applied it to different clusters of human beings that to which you applied certain racial characterization, uh, then you have this gloss of scientific validity uh, that would uh, sort of not only explain, but justify uh, European superiority in the world. Uh, so social Darwinism uh, was, in a sense, the popularization of Darwinian science to human society and the claim that you could understand the operations of human society in the same way as you understood the evolution of species. That is, of course, is a huge leap, and it's not a scientific leap, but it is one that was made in the imagination, but one that took hold. Uh, and social Darwinism uh, became a very broadly accepted kind of outlook in the late 19th century uh, and even into the 20th century. Uh, and uh, did, as I say, seem to have the validity, uh, the power of science behind it, uh, and thus uh, made it even more credible uh, in, in among people at the time. For some, looking at this issue of, of survival of the fittest, uh, they then began to apply it to not just the contest between groups of people, uh, but to look within, uh, say, this starts in England, uh, a eugenics movement, people in England saying, particularly if you get the mass urbanization, the emergence of a British working class living in terrible slums in England, living conditions, hygiene way down, health way down. It looked like English, the English race was degenerating. Uh, and the question now was, how do you save the nation from degeneration? Uh, and that you had to, in a sense, try to promote the procreation and multiplication of the fit and discourage the procreation and multiplication of the unfit. Uh, and so the notion of eugenics was now uh, not to stand back and let a process of natural selection take place, but in fact you should have government policy to engineer selection, to maximize the production of the fit, to diminish the production of the unfit, so that society at large did not degenerate. And people looked at alcoholism, mental health, and these other things, and proclaim certain people in society unfit, and they should not be allowed to procreate, and other people should be encouraged, in fact, uh, to multiply 
uh, and uh, to increase uh, their appropriation to raise the level of society. So eugenics was now a kind of medicalization, we might say, of a combination of racism and Darwinism. Uh, and its goal now, as I say, was to kind of engineer a fit society. So the terms of fit, unfit, degeneration are now, in a sense, put into a medical framework. Uh, and particularly in England, the United States, Germany, Scandinavia, this often was transferred into, into public policy. So you have sterilization laws, for instance, where certain people were designated as unfit and sterilized. Uh, and not surprisingly, the criteria for deciding who was fit and who was unfit uh, very often victimized both uh, people of color and uh, people of poverty. Uh, and that they were deemed as, quote, manifesting uh, a lack of middle class respectability, middle class virtue, middle class discipline. They had not proven themselves in the marketplace as being capable uh, of being productive members of society, uh, and that if they were allowed to multiply, they would drag society down, lead to increasing degeneration. So certainly in the United States and uh, elsewhere, uh, the impact of sterilization laws and eugenics movement was vastly disproportionately on people of color and people in poverty. Uh, but again, this did not as yet have a anti-Semitic side to it, but it's going to be one of the toolkits out of which uh, we're going to see this uh, new anti-Semitism borrow, uh, and it's going to be part of a, of a subsequent fusion. So uh, these are different streams, we might say, different tributaries, imperialism, racism, social Darwinism, eugenics, uh, all of which are operating out there, so far not yet connected to anti-Semitism, uh, but available uh, as part of accepted popular discourse, accepted way in which you think about the world, uh, viewed as having academic and scientific legitimacy, uh, and uh, that that is going to be part of later a very toxic and potent mix. Uh, the way, in a sense, in which Jews become brought into this? How does, how, when, when do we add in the sense the anti-Semitic element? Uh, that really comes uh, in, in, in the latter part of the 19th century. You have already, uh, as I say, a growing economically triggered emergence of a new resentment against Jews out of the perceived uh, advantages the Jews have taken of the dual revolution as the beneficiaries in which those who are the social losers asking the question, who benefits, uh, say, if they benefit, they must be taking it from me. Uh, and so that you begin to get a popular reaction against emancipation and the emergence of anti-Semitism as a potential tool of political mobilization uh, for uh, some different groups trying to mobilize people to organize them around uh, targeting a scapegoat, targeting an unpopular group, targeting someone around whom you can rouse resentments. Uh, the potential uh, of anti-Semitism is there. And two countries in Europe in the late 19th century, this reached this kind of apex. Uh, it's most uh, it's visible. Uh, one was in Russia, uh, where there is increasing pressure against uh, the authoritarian government of the Tsar, uh, increasing revolutionary activity. And uh, a reaction to that uh, by some uh, to try to, in a sense, displace resentment against the government onto uh, the very large Jewish minority of Western Russia. Uh, and the term pogrom is, in fact, a Russian word. It means an anti-Jewish uh, mass violence. Uh, and some of the people around uh, the Tsar trying to, in a sense, deflect discontent would foment uh, and uh, instigate uh, anti-Semitic uh, uprisings or, or attacks. Uh, and uh, pogroms broke out in various parts of the Jewish area of settlement uh, in uh, Russia in the late 19th century. The Jewish, uh, the, the Tsarist police uh, went beyond that uh, 
in concocting a forged, a, a, a fabricated document known as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, in which, uh, and this is, if you want, uh, a, a early example of engineered misinformation, which we now, of course, see on the Internet all the time, when I say the, the, the beginnings of an organized campaign of misinformation sponsored by a government for raw political purpose, the Chronicles of Elders of Zion might be a prime example. Uh, it was purported to be a real document, manufactured by the Tsarist police, in which they portrayed, in effect, a whole Jewish conspiracy. That the elders of Judaism were meeting in a cemetery in Prague and planning how they were going to rule and dominate the world by various different connivances, uh, and uh, that uh, the whole world was threatened by this world Jewish conspiracy uh, being hatched and concocted uh, by uh, so called Jewish elders. Uh, and this was, in fact, uh, you know, spread uh, as a pamphlet and, and, and began to sell like hotcakes. I mean, it got translated into a number of languages. Uh, and it got taken over in other parts of Europe as well. It was exposed as a forgery in uh, the press. Didn't matter. Uh, this was a first case of where facts don't get in my way. I want to believe this because it satisfies me. So you had the spreading of a, of a totally false and fabricated pamphlet as a deliberate act of misinformation uh, that became uh, a bestseller in Europe, spreading around various countries and being uh, grabbed up by and disseminated by various people uh, to whom it was useful. So an example of, of, of exploiting anti-Semitism for political purposes, uh, certainly we had seen, uh, and in fact triggering and, and instigating violence in the pogroms, uh, that is taking place in Russia. At the same time, uh, it begins to emerge in France. Uh, and that you have uh, in France uh, a period uh, of reaction against, in a sense, the French Revolution. This is France in the sense of the 19th century is a, is a kind of constant civil war between those that supported and wanted to preserve and perpetuate the benefits of the French Revolution, liberal democratic revolution, and those that wanted counter-revolution. Uh, and in the late, late 19th century, in a sense, the counter-revolutionaries uh, adopted and appropriated anti-Semitism. And the occasion for that was the so-called Dreyfus Affair. Uh, Dreyfus was a rare case of a French Jewish officer on the general staff. Of course, there weren't many Jews in the French army, and it was even rare for one of them to be a fast-track promotion uh, to the elite of the French officer corps. Someone signaled out as having huge promise. Uh, but uh, Dreyfus had a, had a splendid record, uh, made his way as the rare Jew into the French uh, general staff, or, of course, he would have had access uh, to military secrets that others did not have. Uh, French counterintelligence uh, began uh, and, uh, by uh, their operations, had a cleaning made in the German embassy in Paris. And cleaning out the, the waste paper basket of the German military attaché, picked up pieces of paper that made it clear that somebody was selling military secrets to the Germans. Now, of course, France and Germany were totally at odds. Germany had defeated France in 1870, taken Alsace-Lorraine, the border territories, for themselves, uh, and left the French very aggrieved. Uh, and uh, that now someone who clearly had access to military uh, Secrets was selling them to the Germans, uh, and a careless German military attaché was throwing some of this into his rape basket after he reported on it uh, to Berlin. So now uh, French military intelligence, if that's not an oxymoron, uh, and we'll see it is an oxymoron, uh, has to find who the spy is. Well, uh, they looked at the general staff and said, who possibly here could be so dishonorable uh, that they would sell French military secrets? Oh, there's a Jew on the general staff. What could be simpler? It must be him. Uh, and so they begin to investigate him, uh, but not all of the evidence works out. Well, evidence is inconvenient, so let's manufacture some evidence to close the case. Since we know it's him to begin with, we just need the evidence to prove what we already know. 
So Dreyfus is framed and court-martialed, uh, convicted in disgrace, uh, and, and um, sent to a life imprisonment on Devil's Island in the, in the Caribbean. Seems to be cases closed. Except for the problem is that the inconvenient notes of German military secrets keep showing up in the waste paper basket of the military attaché of the German embassy, and clearly the spy is still at work, and it can't be Dreyfus because he's 7,000 miles away uh, in solitary confinement on Devil's Island. The first reaction of the French military is to keep that very secret because you don't want to reveal that you didn't catch the right name. But gradually within the military, a couple of muckrakers do figure out uh, what's going on, uh, and uh, they spill the beans to uh, a prominent French author, Emile Zola, uh, who writes a blistering op-ed piece, we would now call it, I accuse uh, of the German, accusing the French military of this vast injustice, and the demand in France is to reopen the case. So you have many people on the conservative side trying to defend the honor of the army, and those on the liberal side saying Dreyfus must be uh, given a new hearing, uh, and we must undo this injustice. And this becomes framed in terms of a conflict that we see happening in many cases. How do you weigh national security, the integrity of the French army, against the rights of one lone individual for convicted and framed Dreyfus? If you are for Dreyfus, you are trying to destroy the French army. Uh, if you are for the French army, the rights of one individual have to be sacrificed uh, to the greater national security. When we had this debate after 9-11, how far does invasion of privacy go? How far does surveillance go? Uh, what are the rights of individuals when, quote, the nation is existentially threatened? Uh, and so the same debate happens in other countries, and it happened in France in the 1890s. But in this case, it centered around a conspicuously Jewish victim. Uh, so as the political temperatures heated up, you had mobs running through the streets of France screaming death to the Jews uh, and others insisting on the sanctity of the rights of individuals and able rights of individuals to justice. Uh, and finally, uh, the army had to bring him back for a new trial. They manufactured more evidence to convict him again, but it was so transparently fraudulent that finally the president of France pardoned Dreyfus because there was no way to get the army to clean up its own, its own business. Uh, but this whole thing basically showed how politicized uh, the issue of anti-Semitism could be uh, and how fraught uh, it had become in France. So we had two countries, Billy, in which uh, violent mobilization of anti-Semitism uh, had already shown uh, various uh, potential uh, as a kind of how to weaponize uh, anti-Semitism. Now, in all of this, of course, I haven't talked about Germany yet, and I've done that very intentionally, because it is important to understand this is not just a story of Germany, even though they will be the main perpetrator in the 20th century, uh, but in fact understand the deep European roots uh, out of which that is going to come. Uh, in fact, one of my professors in, in, in graduate school, George Mossa, uh, who was a very famous cultural historian, uh, trying to sort of capture the degree to which, by the late 19th century, no one would have thought Germany to be the particularly uh, anti-Semitic country in Europe, the country of particular danger, uh, posed a kind of hypothetical question. You know, imagine somebody in Europe in 1900 had said, within 50 years, all the Jews of Europe are going to be murdered. And he said, the answer would have been, well, I suppose that's possible. Those French or Russians are capable of anything. No one would have said Germany. Uh, at that point, the hot spots of anti-Semitism were in France and Russia. Uh, that Germany was still, in fact, the land where Jewish social mobility and advancement was perhaps more advanced than anywhere else in Europe uh, and would not have been uh, the country uh, that would be suspected as the origins of the genocide of the Jews uh, within a few short decades. Uh, so we've tried to, in these first two periods, sort of look at this issue of why the Jews and this long tradition of, 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 of uh, 
of European anti-Semitism, how that will tie into Germany and in particular to German nationalism uh, and how this fusion of racism, nationalism, and anti-Semitism is going to come together in Germany uh, is what we want to pick up uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in the next lecture.